Asbury University. I'll begin with uh, the first question to Maria and Ari. So, the disability community has achieved a great number of legal wins, and thus it has created a great deal of social change that is tied to the legal process and the formal policy-making process. But, here's our question, it, it has been far less successful in achieving similar social and cultural victories. Why is that? Um, I think that's an interesting question. Uh, thanks, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, there's an old story about the signing ceremony of the ADA back in 1990. Um, and uh, George H.W. Bush, the president at the time, is walking up to the podium and he's getting ready to, you know, to sign the Americans with Disabilities Act. This is it's a momentous occasion that advocates have been fighting for for years. It's an extraordinary thing. Um, and you know, there are a number of members of the disability community who help make this moment possible in the audience. And, and you know, there are two senior advocates, you know, senior disability rights advocates, and who are also disabled people sitting in the audience. And one of them leans over to the other and whispers, do you think he's read it? <laughs> and the other one leans over and says, well, dear God, I hope not. <laughs> uh, and the point behind that is, um, I think the disability community has, and the disability rights movement kind of has a history of advancing our policy and our legal victories um, in some ways by um, soft selling the full scope of what we're asking for. Um, you know, I, I think if you had gone to the United States Congress during the debates over the Americans with Disabilities Act um, and said, well, um, you know, 10 years later, the Supreme Court is going to rule that this law you're about to pass means that every state has a responsibility to deliver Medicaid long-term services and supports in the most integrated settings. And you're gonna see the Justice Department coming after states that are segregating people and institutions. And you're going to see, you know, move against sheltered workshops. And you're going to see this utilized to help advance the idea of disability rights, you know, well beyond the communities that are traditionally viewed as people with disabilities. Um, I don't want to say they wouldn't pass it, um, but it, it would have been a much harder sell than it otherwise might have been. Um, and I think that's interesting in part because it's kind of the reverse of how it usually goes with civil rights movements. Typically, you win the public, um, and then you win policymakers as a result of having won the public. And the disability rights movement has never really worked that way, in part because we haven't excelled at turning out mass numbers of people. We haven't really excelled at winning social and cultural victories. Um, and really what we've tried to do, um, and there are a variety of reasons for this, um, you know, not least of which being the, the significant impoverishment of our community relative to other civil rights movements and other communities, but we've tried to kind of leverage legal and policy victories into eventually leading to social and cultural change. Um, and that's great, and I think that's important, but what it's left us with is kind of um, a skill set on the part of our, our more senior advocates and on the part of a lot of our more established disability rights organizations is really well geared towards influencing laws, really well geared towards influencing regulation, in some cases really well geared towards bringing strategic litigation, all very important things, but isn't necessarily really well geared towards winning hearts and minds. Um, and that, that worries me. Um, I think if you kind of try and look at a ratio between the people who kind of study a community um, and the people who 
uh, or study a community's identity and kind of progressive civil rights work um, and the people who kind of identify from that progressive perspective and are involved in that civil rights work, um, I think what you'll find is that ratio is very different in the disability community than in other communities. Um, a surprisingly high percentage of people who have a positive disability identity, um, you know, and are actively tracking disability rights advocacy are in disability studies departments or are working in disability rights. Um, and because it's our jobs, we look for concrete and measurable things because that's our responsibility. Um, but it also means that we don't see the kind of the broader cultural conversations uh, about disability that we see in the context of other identities. So I would just throw that out there. I'd be curious yeah. what you think. So I'm going to bounce off of your idea in particular of winning the public and kind of maybe talk a little bit about why that hasn't happened. Um, for one thing, I think the majority of disability organizations, particularly disability civil rights organizations, are what I would call reactive organizations. They are going to react to a situation that is unjust, to a situation where someone is experiencing prejudice um, or isn't able to access um, what they need. And <laughs> I think there are a few, but they don't yet have the political and social capital um, who are envisioning kind of a more just system and culture to begin with. So instead of trying to react and fit into this culture and society that isn't working, where are we envisioning something new? Where are we being proactive? Um, and I think most of the disability community's kind of wins have been in reaction to something else instead of saying, here is how it should be, why don't we build it? Um, I think a great example, um, and I want to bring up examples of higher education because of the space that we're in, is <coughs> President Obama's recent um, initiative to make higher education a better investment for more people. That is a very, very good goal considering the amount of debt that all students are being straddled with right now. Um, but his metrics for getting colleges and universities to show that they're a worthwhile investment are graduation rates and are job placements after graduation. If you are a student who has a medical condition or who is experiencing accommodation issues, you might not, not, you might not be able to graduate within four years, right? You're going to experience barriers coming into the workforce that students without disabilities may not experience. So ultimately, it's disincentivizing um, schools from accepting students with disabilities because it's going to mess up their metrics, or that, that could happen. So you have to wonder, why wasn't the disability community there? You know, we knew that that was a huge part of his agenda and his administration. And why didn't we just say, hey, Obama, put it like, we're here. We're at the table already, right? We have groups. And why don't we say, here's, here's how these metrics could work for you that wouldn't exclude students with disabilities. So that's, that's a very interesting point. And I, I want to springboard off of that, because um, I think you're right about the policy analysis yeah. there. But I think that there is kind of an underlying dynamic with regards to the disability community's ability to influence um, the White House and senior policymakers that aren't focused on disability, um, that I think, you know, needs to be really explored. Because the disability community has always been pretty effective at influencing people in the government whose full-time job is disability policy. You know, uh, Kathy Martinez, Michael Uden, you know, uh, et cetera. For, for clarification, yeah. these are secret assistant secretaries within major federal departments. Right, right. Yeah. You know, people whose full-time job is disability policy, they will talk to the disability rights organizations. Um, but, but I think it's entirely conceivable, um, you know, that there wasn't really any outreach to the disability community on this. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting to think about what that implies. You know, I say this not to defend the groups in the disability community right. who, who are disproportionately reactive and 
probably should have been more on that, but you know, for over a year, the White House position of disability liaison was, was empty. Right. Um, you know, it's hard to think of another community that would lack a single point of contact, you know, within the White House for that long a period of time. Um, and part of the reason for that is I think the White House and I think most non-disability focused policymakers look at the disability community as a community that is often effective at influencing key elite decision makers. You know, it's the kind of the hidden army approach. Um, you know, how did we pass the ADA? Well, we found out, you know, every person with a disability or family member of a person with a disability in, you know, Congress and in government, and we worked to influence them. We aren't so great at influencing the broader public. And so they can often feel comfortable ignoring us, particularly when we're outside of our traditional spheres. Let me ask a follow-up question. How would you suggest to, given the description that you just uh, presented, how would you suggest to an everyday citizen, uh, someone who identified as disabled or someone who didn't identify as disabled or someone who has uh, disabled fam family members, how would you suggest to those ordinary citizens to uh, affect policy that is proactive rather than reactive um, in the ways that you describe? Well, I'll go with that yeah. since it was my comment. Um, so I think as a person with a disability or as a family member of someone with a disability, you have to come in informed. So that's the first question is how do you become informed in the first place? Because if you go into a, a school board meeting and say, my children's needs aren't getting met. Or if you go into a, a city council meeting and say, I need public transportation or else I can't get to work. Um, again, as Ari has pointed out, if they're a policymaker who isn't focused on disability, they may not be aware of the options that are out there to solve these problems. And, um, and I understand that even that statement is a little bit problematic because the burden is on you. Um, but that's where we are. So how do you become informed? I think that, that thankfully, you know, due to the web, there's a greater availability of information about disability resources. Um, and it's information, a whole lot of it, if you follow in the blogosphere, from disabled people themselves. And I think that that can equip parents, family members, people with disabilities first and foremost with power. Um, I also you know, think that being watchful of where policies are headed. Again, um, hearing, hearing desires to make things more affordable always gets me a little bit worried because disabled people have typically been seen as drains on the economy, right? So I, I become very watchful around any initiative that does that. And it may, I'm not saying that all initiatives that are around affordability are bad, they can be very, very helpful, but I just, I always watch. So it's kind of learning based on disability history what devices and what policies have been used against us in the past that we can prevent from being used against us again. So. I think that's very valid and I think it's very accurate, particularly at the individual level. Yeah. Um, I do think we need a conversation about what we can do at kind of the collective or community-wide level about this and, and how we can be. I, I don't necessarily want to use the word proactive because I think that's a part of it, but I think it's, it's also how can we be more of a presence um, in these kinds of conversations. Um, and, and to me, the key is infrastructure. Uh, and sometimes that's, that's an advocacy infrastructure in terms of policy or politics. Sometimes that's a cultural infrastructure or social infrastructure, or financial infrastructure. But, but let me give you an example, um, you know, of what I mean. Um, I think earlier this year, uh, the Seattle Children's Hospital decided to put together these, these bus ads um, that uh, featured this, you know, cute little kid on the bus and, um, you know, a little 
word bubble that said, um, let's wipe out, uh, I think it was something like cancer, diabetes, and autism in his lifetime. Um, and that was something that we had a problem with, um, you know, just because as autistic people, we're, we're not, you know, so much fans of being wiped out um, and, you know, who we are being wiped out. And, you know, that's not really our vision for where we want researchers um, and advocates to be focusing. Um, now, we were able to respond because we have a chapter in Seattle, because we've got a lot of folks on the ground in Seattle who have a sense of uh, positive autistic identity, and because we were trying to build those things well before those, that, that particular situation happened. Now, I think tonight, as we speak, there is a lecture um, at, I think, Congre Congregation Rodef Shalom in Manhattan um, by Eustacia Cutler the mother of Temple Grandin, um, uh, who has been invited to this congregation to talk about disability and inclusion. This particular person recently published an article in the Daily Beast called Autism and Pedophilia, in which she talked about her opinion, for some strange reason, why um, she believes autistic men want to learn about sex from 10-year-olds as opposed to you know, from grown uh, adults and why she thinks that we should be watched as potential pedophiles. We're not doing anything about that because we don't have a uh, sufficient presence in New York. Um, and I think organizations in cities where we do have a presence think about what they do and think about how we might respond to them. Organizations in cities where we or any other disability group that is concerned on this um, don't have a presence, don't. So I, I think it's really the work that goes in before the incident that, that, that speaks to that. And so I often think about the, the locuses of, or the loci of disability rights and kind of the disability community. And in my opinion, they're uh, Berkeley, Northern California, DC, and Chicago. You know, those would be my top three. And I think it highlights exactly what you're pointing out is that um, because of infrastructure building in cities, and particularly smaller communities, there is you know, not the physical infrastructure for people with disabilities to get out there and lead the kinds of lives that they want to lead, very often, not always. Um, but what this creates is that you know, you're somebody with a mobility impairment like myself, where am, I, you know, where am I going to live? Or where are lots of disabled people going to live? It's those cities. So when we think about winning social battles and cultural battles, how can we get more disabled people in more places? You know. Yeah, yeah, I think it's interesting because different disability communities have different, you know, degrees of uh, kind of cultural bases. I mean, right. You don't start shit with the deaf community in Rochester. No. I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> that, ain't, that yeah. ain't ending well for you, my friends. You know, that's, that's, not, that's not going out. You know, um, and there's, there's, you know, other examples. The inclusive education movement has always had a strong presence in Syracuse. You know, there's, there's lots, you know, Minnesota, yeah. a lot of other examples. But um, that kind of speaks to the issue of cross-disability solidarity, because yeah. very often you, you won't see, you know, kind of that cross-pollination that you might hope for. It might imply we would all have a better national infrastructure. Uh, you've suggested uh, that disability policy uh, can be influenced by disability studies uh, in education, uh, especially in higher education. Uh, could you talk about what you understand as the actual relationship uh, or perhaps the aspirational relationship between disability studies and uh, in higher education and, of course, as it lives in uh, education all the way across the spectrum, and policy making, advocacy, and disability politics. You want to take that first? Or? It doesn't matter. No? Okay. Um, all right, I'll jump in. Okay. Um, in the, um, I think it was the late 70s, it might have been the early 80s, Burden Blatt uh, published a, a photo essay called Christmas in Purgatory. Um, and it was a collection of photos taken secretly 
um, from institutions all across the Northeast. Uh, and it, you know, along with Geraldo Rivera's expose of Willowbrook and a number of other things, played a major role in turbocharging the deinstitutionalization movement and really getting that up off the ground. Um, you know, I think it's interesting to try and kind of ask the question, what, what's the equivalent um, in terms of what's coming out of the academy to Christmas in purgatory today? Um, and, and I gotta tell you, not, not a heck of a lot comes to mind. Um, and I think that's a problem because disability studies could be very important and very powerful to the disability policy community and at various points it has and with various specific programs and specific um, individuals it sometimes still is. Um, and you see some disability studies programs that have a very strong relationship with the advocacy community um, and are, are thinking critically about public policy and are thinking critically also about culture and, and analysis. But I also think there are large parts of the disability studies community that are not really being accessible to the broader disability community. Um, you know, if you're writing an academic journal article about cognitive accessibility, it should probably be cognitively accessible. <laughs> strange taste there, but it's my opinion. Um, you know, and I do think, you know, optimally we would be fighting, using disability studies as the disability community's kind of representative in the war of ideas. And uh, we really need that in a lot of areas, particularly around bioethics, where, you know, bluntly the stuff the academy puts out about disability is, is, is horrifying by any rational, you know, uh, calculation. Um, you know, I don't know that we, we have it. Uh, and so we've got to kind of translate certain parts, not all, but certain parts of the disability studies community to help them understand that, you know, we don't need you to talk about Foucault every third sentence. Um, we, we need you to be integrating your work with the larger body of advocacy that's, that's coming out of the disability rights movement. I agree with you to an extent. Um, I agree that translation from scholarly research to policy is incredibly difficult and it often takes an exceptionally long time. Um, I went to a symposium on this very issue, research translation into policy, and the research revealed that on average it takes 16 years to translate what is then emerging practices into policy. Um, I also think accessibility in general is a very, very big issue for anything coming out of the academy. However, <laughs> um, I think that disability studies has and is playing a role in the policy making process through education generally. You know, you get um, students in freshman writing requirements and in freshman seminars who learn about disability studies, um, whether it is through reading, you know, a disability history of the United States or through reading <coughs> disability aesthetics by Tobin Siebers, um, and they can then take that information to whatever major it is they choose, you know, and it could be bioethics, it could be psychology, um, it could be medicine, and learn to apply it there because there are a number of other disciplines who are very, very good or that are very, very good with equipping students with applicable skills. You know, so it's taking your disability studies knowledge that you gain from uh, the liberal arts and humanities and ultimately when you become that professional after you've graduated, um, whether it's a professional policymaker or a think tanker, you are aware and it is, your perspective is informed by it. I also think we have to be aware of how disability studies is developing and evolving as a discipline. So the foundational scholarship that really came out in the 80s, if I'm right, <laughs> um, is it's new. You know, I came out in the 80s. You came out in the 80s. The late 80s. Um, right. <laughs> and so we have to recognize that first generation disciplinary scholarship is very different than third generation scholarship. So right now, I know graduate students in disability studies who are doing work on housing and affordable housing for 
black women, African American women with disabilities. And it's highly precise, and there's lots of numbers attached to it, and it will go on to inform policy. There's work coming out of um, University of Illinois Chicago around social entrepreneurship for people with disabilities that will directly inform their new employment first policy. And so, but one thing I do think we need to be concerned about are general labor trends in the academy. <clears throat> so these graduate students now who are doing this great research that could be so useful for policy making in the future, and what's happening in the academy, will they be able to get jobs once they graduate? Furthermore, will they be able to get secure jobs with benefits when they graduate? Um, I think it's important for anybody connected to disability rights, whether they have a disability or not, to pay attention to trends like that, particularly with disciplines like disability studies. And I agree with you. And yeah. I do think, you know, I think I said, you know, this is, this is not a universal issue. I think that by and large, disability studies has been a very positive thing and is making an impact in the disability policy realm. It's just that we need to be reinforcing that optimally disability studies and, and considering oneself a scholar or practitioner of the above um, shouldn't just be about understanding um, the various forms of oppression uh, that people with disabilities face or deconstructing those things. It should be also um, building the skill sets to, to do something about it. And, and I think you do see that in a lot of areas. Um, it's not yet universal, um, but I think you do see it in a lot of areas, particularly around the interface with education. I think you, you do see a growing amount of work around um, a disability studies analyses of educational pedagogy that can be very helpful. Well, because uh, people with disabilities, as you've suggested, are much more integrated now into public life as a result of disability politics and policy, um, and that the idea that disability might be a positive identity has led to people with disabilities or to disability being represented much more fully in the media, uh, also in advertisements, in television, in film, and in the news as a social and a political issue. Can you comment on the political and cultural effects of this new attention to disability in the media? In particular, maybe give us some examples of what you think of our progressive trends or regressive trends in terms of the goals of disability politics and policy. I'll start on this one. Please. Um, so I've seen a surge of a greater presence of characters with disabilities on late night television shows. Um, we have Ironside, which was on NBC, it's going to get canceled. Uh, I'm thankful for that, personally. Um, we have Glee, which we can talk about. Um, complicated. Complicated. <laughs> we have the Michael J. Fox show, right? And that is what I think is the most progressive example of disability inclusion in the media, because you have Michael J. Fox as a man, as a dad, as a husband, um, who Scott Parkinson's, and he'll make fun of himself in, in ways that to me are very realistic as someone who makes fun of myself. Um, and <clears throat> at the same time as you've got this surge, I think we still see characters with disabilities who are introduced on other shows as kind of ways to learn a lesson. Like, <laughs> let's, let's all get informed about this disorder or inclusion, and then they leave the show after one or two episodes. And I want to see the day when a character, a disabled character is introduced, and they can, you know, teach their lesson, and then we actually get to see that show's world change as a result of that character's presence. I, I don't think we're there yet, but I think we're making progress towards it. So. I, I think the phenomena you just pointed out is, is absolutely a huge problem. I think it's, it's still the main way in which disability is presented 
in media. Um, I like to call it very special episode syndrome. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, occasion, very special yes. episode syndrome. It's a terrible, you know, epidemic on our airwaves. Um, where a show contracts a disabled character for an episode or two. Um, but fortunately, they're usually able to, to kick it after too long, and you know, we go back to the institution or segregated school where presumably we belong. Um, but, but, but I think what's interesting about this is that uh, that can teach us the, the, the existence of that phenomena and criticizing that phenomena can actually teach us a lot, both about what's wrong and, and how we can spot what's right about disability in media. Um, because what's, what's the hallmark of very special episode syndrome? That disabled people exist for the purposes of non-disabled people, whether it's in the form of disability as a, as a plot device, you know, think every James Bond movie ever. Particularly <laughs> with the villain. Yes. You know, well, always yes. the villain. Every James Bond villain ever. Or, or disability as, you know, you know uh, the TV shows or movies that are like really long public service announcements. You know, this is very uh, strange. Um, you know, I agree. I think Michael J. F the Michael J. Fox show is excellent. I would, I would call it the, the, the second best disability <coughs> representation in the media today. Um, I think the first best, and I'm biased because it's my disability, okay. is Abed in Community, which I am a, an ardent fan of. Um, actually, the reason I'm, I'm a fan of Abed, other than the fact that Abed is awesome, um, <laughs> is that it's, it's one of the only representations I've ever seen of an autistic character in which that character has agency and autonomy um, and, and is actually in on the joke. Um, you know. In fact, he's more in on the joke than, than everyone else. Um, he's the only one who seems to know that they're in a television show. <laughs> uh, but I, I think that idea of agency and autonomy and the difference between laughing with and laughing at is, is actually really important. And I think the Michael J. Fox show also does a pretty good job of that. Um, you know, they lampoon the very special episode phenomena uh, in the first episode pretty effectively. To, I believe, Rosemary, you asked specifically about kind of media and, and policy, and I'm going to go back to Glee. Um, Glee has had and has a number of characters with disabilities on the show, whether they are actually disabled people or not. Um, but obviously the one with the most staying power is Becky Jackson, the cheerleader who is, has Down syndrome and becomes a kind of henchwoman for Sue Sylvester, <laughs> right? So. I really wanted to see Becky go to college. You know, I right now that's a growing trend of increasing um, students with intellectual disabilities within colleges and universities. Instead of taking that route, which Glee could have very easily done, they had Becky get scared and bring a gun to school because she needed protection. And I think the this anxiety around graduating from high school is real and very present for every student, you know, not just a student who has Down syndrome. And they could have acknowledged that and maybe acknowledged how it might be a little bit complicated for her and still had her consider college. And I think that was a real missed opportunity from, you know, Fox um, because it could have initiated this whole co national conversation around what's happening policy-wise, I think. It's interesting, because uh, I think that entire um, situation, that episode, uh, and the responses to it were kind of indicative of kind of the state of uh, a certain lack of relationships in the cross-disability community. I remember after that episode came out, you had a prominent figure from a Down syndrome uh, organization saying, well, you know, this is really inappropriate. It would have been better if the character that brought a gun to school had some kind of mental illness. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just kind of like, what? really? <laughs> really? <laughs> that's, that's the quote you give to the media. That's, that's your argument. So, but I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, and another issue you alluded to there that I think is important is um, relatively few, and, and Becky is um, an exception, relatively few of characters with disabilities are played by actors or actresses with disabilities. Um, and that's, that's, that's a significant problem in and of itself. 
Um, you know, and I don't know that that would wholly fix the problem because okay. in other communities there's a pretty long history of characters kind of being forced into playing roles, yeah. you know, that don't necessarily represent their community really very well. Um, but I do think it would at least contribute to addressing the problem if um, in order to do a show uh, that involves a character with a disability, you actually have to interact with a person with a disability. That would be, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll ask a final question, a rather open-ended question of you, and then um, the audience can continue the conversation. What do you view as the future of the disability rights movement? And perhaps we could add, what would you like the future <laughs> of the disability rights movement to be? I think we need to um, start to seriously address the fact that we are not taken seriously by those with power. Um, if in this country, politics you know, and advocacy is typically a game of chess, we're playing checkers. Um, and it's a problem. It's a, it's a, it's a very big problem. Um, I think a lot of people have pointed this out, that the disability community um, is occasionally able to come together and exert really serious political influence, like with the passage of the ADA, um, but it often isn't able to do those things. Um, and there are a variety of reasons for that. Uh, I think one of them is the fact that a disproportionate amount of our political lobbying capacity lies with provider organizations that have specific economic interests. Um, and as the disability community's needs start to shift um, away from uh, just getting funding for services, which is still important, but to uh, looking at what kind of services are in question, that's going to be a bigger and bigger issue. So I'd like to see the disability kind of community and disability rights movement be more shifted to be controlled by people with disabilities. But I, I think we also just have to start seriously thinking about these questions of how we build infrastructure on the ground, how we build the capacity outside of 501c3 organizations so we can start playing in electoral politics. And also, I mean, just bluntly, how we can make progress in our priorities at a time when we're really seeing backsliding on, on so many civil rights priorities across the board. And so we're gonna be, have to be very creative um, and I'm not really sure that the solutions are entirely present yet, except that um, we can't keep on going on the way that we have. I agree with you to a great extent. I think two things that you and I have both brought up are cross-disability conversations and organizing and action. Um, and also building both that physical infrastructure but also the socio-cultural infrastructure that is needed to really organize such a diverse community in such a large country. You know, if we need to create the critical mass to push our civil rights goals, um, we have to make sure that we're getting it in, in every state. Um, but I would also ask, you know, what are the disability community's civil rights goals? Because I think you ask, you know, you, you ask me, we'd give you possibly different responses. And so I think there needs to be some kind of agreement on what our next ish big issues are. Because um, there isn't a whole lot, you know, in my opinion. See, and that's complicated. Yeah. Because we're never going to get full agreement. I don't even think we're going to get consensus because there are so many different interests. Um, and I'm not sure how we get around that. Um, I, I do feel like we've got um, this this sort of challenging dynamic, which in some ways is a good thing and in some ways is a bad thing, 
Um, you know, Ed Roberts said that in order to be a good disability rights advocate, you needed to be an advocrat, right. you know, part advocate and part bureaucrat. I think a lot of members of our community are that way. Certainly, you know, I, I have a lot of bureaucratic thinking or thoughts about how to wrangle bureaucracies. Right. I'm sure you do too. Um, the problem with that kind of thinking is, you know, while it's very important and, and very valuable when you're trying to, to tweak the specifics of public policy, which is what both of our jobs involve, it doesn't really lend itself right. to mass organizing campaigns, you know. What do we want? We want CMS 2249P2 exactly. to be issued into a final notice of proposed rulemaking or a final notice of final rule, you know. It's, and when do we want it? Within the next six to nine months. It doesn't, it doesn't really roll off the tongue. Yeah, um, right. And I, I, I don't know that we've really thought clearly about what that big picture is um, or how we square the fact that it's going to be different um, between one community, one sector of our community or another. What would your goals be if you were to name one or two goals that each of you has as advocates and as people who identify as disabled? I would say that um, one, of the, one of them would definitely be start routing disability service provision, um, you know, and, and disability services in general through uh, programs and through infrastructures that the middle class has to use too. Um, one of the single largest problems in our community is that um, almost all disability services are financed through a poverty program, Medicaid, and we've got to defend Medicaid, and it's very important. But you know, look at the hubbub about healthcare.gov not working very well. Well, bluntly, anybody who's gone to a Medicaid office or Social Security <laughs> Administration office in the last, I don't know, 30 years, this is not uh, you know, a, a new experience to them. Uh, and to me, that says the public is only really going to care about us having a good user experience and us having good access to the things we need if it's through an infrastructure that um, the the broader scope of the populace is also using. Um, I think there's an opportunity uh, to do that with the new marketplace system. You're going to have a lot more people with a lot more different you know, backgrounds in terms of income interacting with a government program in the next decade or a few decades. Um, you know, and hopefully that'll give us a chance to maybe piggyback some of our um, necessary health coverage and services and other things on top of that. So I'm going to answer the question a little bit differently. Um, I, I'm going to talk about some ideas that I think are really interesting that could provide um, a great deal of social and cultural change um, for a number of people with disabilities who receive social security benefits there is a marriage penalty, right? You get married, your income shifts, you no longer receive your benefits. And that means that you may not be able to receive services that you need to survive or just live on a day-to-day -day basis. So when you think about the victories that have been won for same-sex marriage, that doesn't include a number of those people who receive benefits, you know, and so as marriage rights are expanded, are they really expanded to everyone who could get married? And so I don't think that that fight will be taken up because it's kind of a political non-starter right now. But, you know, if we could see people with this disability saying, I want to be able to get married and what that means in the broader kind of U.S. <coughs> cultural meaning and knowledge, what will that do for us? I also think as the nature of military service changes, it means that we can see soldiers with disabilities. And when you think about who a soldier is and what he or she looks like, it's a very able, physically fit body. Um, and so the idea of a disabled soldier and not one who has served and become disabled and come back, but one who has been disabled since birth or just disabled in their lifetime, um, how would that really change the way people think about what folks with disabilities can do? 
um, those are just two suggestions. Well, thank you very much for addressing the questions that we put together. I'd like to open up the uh, conversation to the audience. Uh, John Branja brought forward the question of uh, the response that um, is sometimes understood as a natural response, a, a kind of physiological, neurological response, that um, people who perhaps understand themselves as non-disabled feel in the presence of people with disabilities and how uh, we might think about addressing that um, discomfort uh, as a challenge um, in fully integrating people with disabilities into the social order. Is that a fair assessment of Absolutely. your question? No, please feel free. I, I agree that that's a hard nut to crack. I also think that in addition to the very visceral discomfort that some people might experience, there is an opposite and equal force of very visceral curiosity um, and fascination. And I think both can be equally toxic, you know, because people with disabilities, they've been uh, people and bodies to be reviled, but they've also been bodies to be stared at and on stage, right? Um, so the usual answer to this question is just get more, more disabled people out there and have them start interacting, um, but that hasn't worked yet. So I, I think that actually medicine um, and the world of medicine and the world of rehab can give us some hope here because um, not only are there more people with disabilities out there in the community today than there ever have been before, but there are generally more people with disabilities altogether than there ever have been before. And there will continue to be as we continue to see advances in medicine. Um, you know, what did the incubator do for the disability community when it allowed premature babies to live? Um, so <coughs> I think, you know, conversations at those levels, like within medical schools, for example, you know, recognizing here is how you contribute to the presence of disability, and that is positive. It doesn't just need to be cured. Um, in the end, these individuals can and are healthy, for example. Um, I name medicine as a kind of location of a whole lot of political and cultural clout. You know, so once disabled people and once the status of disability becomes something that is not marked as bad or that's something that you don't want or will ruin your life, but is said something that you can live with, um, those interactions will become less tense. And I think it has to start with the sources that make disability bad and that make, you know, something that needs to be cured. And um, medicine is one of them, but I also think, again, that medicine actually allows a whole lot more people with disabilities to be here, so. I, I think, first, I think you're right. I mean, you do, you, you do see that kind of response. Um, both in terms of people, uh, the response people have to people with um, visible disabilities yeah. and the response that you see in terms of how people approach people with hidden disabilities differently after a disclosure. And, and I think that's interesting because one of the things that it points out is, you know, we're really, we're not dealing with any kind of ingrained biological thing here. We're dealing with the natural human you want to call it natural, but you know, a common human um, tendency to uh, stigmatize or be frightened of difference, and then to see that kind of validated at the broad cultural scale because that's how people talk about disability. Um, and, and I agree with everything Maria said in terms of how it's going to be a slow process of change, and a lot of it is going to involve more disabled people being out there people's opinions generally do not change from public service announcements. <laughs> they, they generally change because of people they know. Um, but I also think that um, one of the ways that this change can be accelerated and made more effective than it has been in the past is through the broader spread of disability culture within the disability community. Um, when you 
and you know, I think a lot of us can speak from experience here. I, I think Maria and I included, and certainly many of you. When when you are kind of you know kind of on your own uh, as a person with a disability, before you develop a positive sense of disability identity or connection to a larger disability community, it's kind of really hard to call people out on on stuff when they do something bad. Or, or even, even to, to, if you have this option, to publicly disclose as a person with a disability. You, you, you either you know, pass, or you try and find ways to cover, or you just won't bring something up if somebody says or does something that's wrong. The rise of disability culture has made it a lot easier for people with disabilities to be change agents among their friends and among their family members. And that can start to, uh, you know, lead to some of the positive cultural change on the, the micro level that we've all been hoping for. So this question is about the uh, gap between policy and implementation and asks the speakers for suggestions about how that question. gap might be most effectively closed. I can. No preference. So, the policy changes that have really created more opportunities for inclusive education have not, have actually, um, in, in my opinion, been faster than changes in um, teacher training programs. So when you want to teach, you go into education and you get an education degree. But if you have an interest in teaching students with disabilities, you get a degree in special education. And special education obviously still exists. There are still um, segregated classrooms. But the greater presence of students with disabilities who are being mainstreamed, um, <coughs> that's fantastic. But mainstream teachers are not equipped with the skills and competencies and policy knowledge that special education teachers may receive. And I'm not saying that we dissolve special education as a discipline, but as a, a nation, as um, you know, university administrators, deans, are thinking about the future of these programs, how can we make sure that kind of mainstream education um, professionals are benefiting from the knowledge that special education teachers receive acknowledging how the classroom has changed as a result of these policy decisions? I have some disagreements okay. with that. I, I largely agree in the sense that I agree that we need mainstream teacher education programs to include education around students with disabilities. Um, I disagree with the statement that um, special education teachers uh, categorically have uh, a better set of tools to than general education teachers with regards to educating students with disabilities. Um, and obviously this is very uh, dependent on the state or the school district or the school or the classroom that you're in. But um, you know, by and large, what the research has shown us is that um, you know, a lot of the myths that we hear regarding special education classrooms, that they offer you know, more opportunities for individualized instruction, that they are safer, you know, that students are, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're just, they're not really true. Um, and it's, it's, I think, interesting that you um, often see a set of skills in special education classrooms that are um, geared toward behavior management or geared toward classroom control um, or even geared towards the set of things that we might refer to as habilitative services, you know, things related to occupational therapy or speech pathology or other things that are in some ways designed to um, provide an intervention around a child's disability. But I, I don't necessarily know that, with the exception of you know a few programs and a few individual, a few areas, you actually see more knowledge on the part of special education teachers on how to actually provide academic instruction um, to students with disabilities. What I would say, in terms of the original question, um, is I think we have never meaningfully enforced IDEA at all. Um, acronyms. Uh, I'm, oh, certainly. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, 
country's major special education law. Um, IDEA is a process-based law. A state will be deemed in compliance with IDEA if it is filling out all of its paperwork on time and meeting extraordinarily modest performance-related goals, which ever since the recession have been suspended in a wide number of states. Um, contrast that with, with No Child Left Behind, which has a lot of flaws. No Child Left Behind is a deeply flawed law, which I think everyone on every side of the political spectrum realizes that we, we need to change. But what No Child Left Behind did do that IDEA has never really done is it said, we're gonna measure on the basis of outcomes. Um, you know, now imagine how IDEA might be different if we were measuring on the basis of outcomes, be those rates of inclusion in the general education classroom, rates of graduation, rates of employment after school, any number of other things. That, that's not really where the emphasis is. I think that's a very big part of the gap between enforcement and the laws we have in the books. Yeah, uh, yeah. the question is about um, applied behavior analysis, which is a, um, a technique that um, a lot of educators and therapists use for um, autistic children and has a sorted history. Um, and the question is um, basically, do you um, find it a dehumanizing practice or not in your sort of basis for your answer? Thank you. So, uh, you know, I think a couple of things are worth mentioning here. There is definitely a very strong history of dehumanizing uh, techniques being utilized and having been utilized really from the beginning of applied behavioral analysis in the autism world. Um, you look back at the original experiments which led to the rise of autism-focused applied behavioral analysis uh, was by O. Ivar Lovas at UCLA. Um, and Lovas, Lovas you know, set his goal as making autistic children, and I quote, indistinguishable from their peers. Now, how many of you wake up in the morning and ask, how can I be more indistinguishable today? Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a problematic premise from the start. Um, and the means that Lovas was willing to use made it even more problematic because Lovas did support the use um, and utilize in his experiments um, aversives. Uh, aversives are a te technique um, called, uh, that involves inflicting pain as a means of behavior modification. And while some people will say, well, ABA is different today than it was then, we actually do have data um, that shows that uh, ABA professionals are more likely to view the use of aversives as an acceptable treatment methodology than any other class of related services professionals. If you compare surveys of what ABA professionals view as an acceptable treatment methodology, um, to what SLPs, speech language pathologists, or occupational therapists, or other types of professionals view as, accept as acceptable, you'll see, I, I would say, a very disturbing um, trend. Um, it's also worth noting that Lovas had two experiments going on at UCLA. One was his autism project, which aimed to make autistic children to recover us to be indistinguishable from our peers. And the other was something called the UCLA Feminine Boys Project, which aimed to recover children deemed at risk of homosexuality in much the same way. Um, and so I think it's, it's very clear to me that the roots of applied behavioral analysis are deeply problematic. And bluntly, the, those problems have not gone away. Now, many people have tried to sell policymakers and legislators um, on the idea that ABA is the only acceptable autism intervention. And that's been grounded in a particular reading of the research that, that I don't share. Um, um, you know, I think the Department of Education's What Works Clearinghouse has actually found the research literature in support of ABA to be substantially weaker than many of the claims that are made. Now, what I do think is important to acknowledge is that there is a broader issue, independent of applied behavioral analysis, of coverage for habilitative services. And that's a broad category 
um, that includes things like speech language pathology, includes things like occupational therapy. It can include coverage for things like ABA, but it could also include coverage for things like floor time um, or certs and other um, autism interventions that frankly have a better human rights record. Um, and many insurers have not covered habilitative services and there is a need to see that covered and there's a need to see laws um, include habilitative services in uh, the requirements for insurance coverage. Where I think those laws go wrong, and, and this is where I would agree with the questioner that Autism Speaks his agenda and their legislative advocacy has been very negative in this respect, is when they name applied behavioral analysis and say this is the habilitative service you should cover. Um, not only is that a intervention which comes with a very checkered history, but it also deprives individuals and families of the choice to select options that um, you know aren't focused on indistinguishability and don't come with fields with such significant ethical uh, and human rights problems. If if this is a, a correct assessment, is um, that? Families who have children with disabilities uh, had a very difficult time influencing um, educational structures, uh, say, 15 years ago, and that you have a sense that that has changed in some ways from what's being spoken about here today has given you a sense that that has changed. So maybe the question embedded in your comment is, um, to what do you attribute those changes? And maybe to give some specific examples of what you think those changes might be that Robert Brown is, um, is uh, understanding from our conversation. Fair? Um, well, first, um, I want to acknowledge that your experience was and is still an all too common one. Um, and I think within the late 80s and around the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, we started seeing um, programs, um, I'm thinking of partners in policy making specifically, that were developed to educate and train um, people with disabilities and their family members to be advocates and to engage in the policy making process. We, we actually went to right. Oh well. So that that's great. And I think there has been limited success of that program in, for example, Minnesota and where it started. And I think individual parents have been able to garner successes within their communities. Um, and I think that program is based on the idea that parents and families will find no greater strength and power than from other families and advocates. And so I think in general, more of those spaces have evolved as the Americans with Disabilities Act as the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act um, have become kind of more prominent in people's minds. I, I still think um, that, it, it, that your experience is the dominant one that happens. Um, I also think that particularly as it relates to the young person with a disability, there is this idea, you know, like why would you want to hang out with other people with disabilities, right? Uh, Ari, why should we be friends? Um, and because if you work, if you are acculturated in a environment where disability is something that either you're not supposed to be proud of, it's not even a lack of pride, it's just a lack of acknowledgement altogether, right? You're supposed to try to pass. And you are supposed to try to adapt as much as you can so that you can be as indistinguishable as possible from your peers. And you know, Ari mentioned it in terms of autism, but I think that's true for a whole lot of disabilities. You know, we have um, the pressure to lip read within the deaf community. Um, you have people with cerebral palsy like myself who are pressured to walk instead of using wheelchairs. Um, and so 
when do you get to that point where you realize not only is disability a good thing, but I really want some other cool friends with disabilities like me. And I think more of that is happening now um, in, in different ways than it was you know, 15, 20 years ago. I think, again, I mentioned this um, before, but I think the internet and blogging has been a way for people to connect. So um, young people with disabilities will read blogs of people who have similar experiences and they will reach out to establish this virtual friendship that winds up not only being something that enriches their lives, but also enriches their ability to become an advocate and make changes in their communities. And I, I would just, I think, add one thing to that. Um, you highlighted something that I think is incredibly important for both self-advocates and parents, which is namely the tendency of service systems to isolate people. Um, and in my experience, that's often deliberate um, because when you perceive of your experience as, well, you know, maybe I'm the only one that's having a problem, um, you know, uh, or this is a struggle I'm going through or what have you, you're a lot weaker, you have a lot less resolve, um, you have a lot less effectiveness than if you can form some kind of broader unity. Um, you know, uh, school districts don't want to be engaged in a conflict with the parent community. Um, you know, they want to be talking to individual parents. Uh, and most of the time, they should be talking with individual parents. But, but when things are going wrong, and there's a need for systemic change that involves looking at the numbers across the school district, that involves looking at the policies across the school district, that there is really a need for organizing. Um, and uh, one of the things that um, you know, has often plagued the disability community in both the self-advocate and the parent forms is how do we build an organizing model that can really reach down to that local level where a lot of that service, that service and programming, particularly in education, is being provided. A really interesting question that's been asked about uh, education uh, envir educational environments for a variety of different groups, and that is what are the benefits and the liabilities of inclusion, and what are the benefits and the liabilities of um, single group education, and how can we maintain both at the same time? Would that be a fair assessment? Or should we maintain both at the same time? So I have a, an opinion on this. <laughs> Why am I not surprised? Um, I think you're in one of the, the, the most difficult positions um, that it's possible to be in uh, in the disability community. Um, that of a service provider, in this case an educational service provider, that um, has to decide uh, whether or not um, they're willing, as a result of a values-based argument, should you agree with it, um, to change their business model. And, you know, I, I do think that's possible. Um, we've seen it in a lot of other contexts. You know, we're seeing sheltered workshops convert to becoming supported employment providers. In fact, we really need them to because otherwise we won't have enough supported employment providers. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of other sort of situations in which this is occurring, and I, I do think that has to happen in your case as well. Um, and it's, it's very difficult to make that judgment because you think to yourself, well, look, you know, um, we know that the broader public school system isn't where it needs to be, and we know that there's, there's going to be a lot of work in order to get them to that point. But you know, I also think it's important to point out that people don't graduate into self-contained worlds. Um, and in fact, if they do, it's a sign of a pretty significant problem um, in failing to prepare them in the education system. If people are graduating into you know, self-contained or you know, as I would call it, segregated workplaces or housing complexes or what have you, um, you know, the, the school system however well-intentioned and however much it's aligned with our other values, 
isn't doing its job. And I, I do think it's very hard, um, in my opinion, I think it's impossible over the long term to prepare people for an integrated post-secondary environment um, with a segregated school environment. That doesn't mean that you say, all right, you know, tomorrow or next school year, we're gonna close up shop and go out of business. But it does mean that you maybe look and explore how you can change the relationship you have with education to providing support within integrated settings and how you can begin a process of individualized planning for each of the 25 students in your school to ask, what would this kid need in order to return to an inclusive setting um, and to make that be a good experience for them? And most do. And, and I think, yes. So they, they yes. And so we are in the transition process for their transition. So they typically go into public schools. And that's the model. So it sounds like you have some experience with that. Um, I think the question that really comes up is, you know, how can you take that experience and make it more systemic so that you're going to be in a position to help support um, and encourage uh, positive change in the public school system, even for kids who, you know, aren't leaving first. Um, a couple of organizations that have done well with that in the past, uh, I'd be glad to recommend them to you. I, I think, you know, TASH and the community of practice, TASH represents is really great. On a local level, the Maryland Coalition for Inclusive Education, and there are many others. But personally, I think that over the, I wouldn't even say long term, I would say over the medium term and, and the near medium term, you have to be thinking aggressively about how you change the way you do business. That's a very difficult process, but I, I, I commend you for starting it. Um, so to wrap up, okay. I, I offer I say you the final word, Maria. That's that's, I don't know if this should be the final word, but that's what we want it to be. An interesting bit of disability history. Um, when you look at people um, who we might consider to be the founders of the, dis the modern disability rights movement. Many of them had polio and many of them met at polio camp. Um, and so it's an interesting beast right there because they are meeting in this very segregated space. Um, you know, one that most of the time we would think is not beneficial and yet that experience helped them build the relationships that ultimately led to a movement. Um, but I emphasize that it was camp. It wasn't school that they went to every day all the time. And so for you, as you're thinking about you know, what you might change and you're emphasizing that transition, I would also ask, how can you make sure that this group of students has opportunities to continue to come together and build those relationships so that they can continue in that positive identity development even after they've been mainstreamed in public schools. So. Thank you. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.